The siege at Ruby Ridge began on the 21st of August 1992 in Boundary County, Idaho. United States deputies attempted to arrest a man named Randy Weaver as he was suspected of selling a modified weapon and failed to attend court. The story is incredibly tragic and much of what occurred could have been avoided if the proper procedures were followed. In my opinion, this case is one of the most fascinating I have ever come across. To fully explain the story of Ruby Ridge, it's important to explain the situation of the Weaver family. Randy Weaver was a Green Beret in the United States Army during the 60s. While serving, he met a woman named Vicky. The two fell in love and married in 1971. In the 1970s, the Weavers came to believe that the biblical doomsday prophecies were being fulfilled. In 1978, Vicky told Randy of a recurring dream. She explained that in her dream, she saw the end times and that she saw themselves together with their family on top of a mountain safe from harm. The Weavers began to plan. They started buying weapons and learned how to live off-grid without any electricity. Their fears of this impending apocalypse were soon cemented by a farming crisis and economic instability. This resulted in many farmers declaring bankruptcy and the industry becoming unstable. This lack of stability greatly worried Randy and Vicky, fearful that work would soon become hard to find. During this period, the couple sold most of their materialistic possessions and decided to take action to get away from what they saw as a corrupt society with a tyrannical government and an impending apocalypse. Plans were made to leave Iowa and seek a place in the mountains where they would be safe. In 1982, the couple found a suitable location that met their specific criteria, and there, Randy and Vicky built a cabin. The location was in a mountainous region called Ruby Ridge in Boundary County, Idaho. At the time, the couple moved there with their three children, Sarah, Samuel, and Rachel. Vicky would later give birth to her fourth child, Elisheba, in a shed behind the family's cabin. The cabin that Vicky and Randy had built had no plumbing, electricity, or gas. The children were homeschooled, and they helped to grow food and hunt. Since the family now lived in such a remote area, they began to seek out friends to have more of a social life. The Weavers were able to make a number of friends in the area and allowed a man named Kevin Harris to live with them. Around 60 miles away from the family cabin was the Aryan Nations compound, a repugnant white supremacist and separatist organization with Nazi and American fascist roots, founded by a man named Richard Butler. The organization subscribed to the belief that white people are the lost tribe of Israel and that the United States should be white and Christian only. They also believed that they should use violence to achieve this if needs be. They had already been linked to a number of violent attacks. And because of this, the Aryan Nations was well on the federal government's radar. The Weaver family began to attend various events held by this organization. At first, this was purely social and mainly because of the Christian identity beliefs the organization held. But as time went on, Randy and Vicky also began to subscribe to more of the radical and racial beliefs. As this organization was flagged as a threat, there were some government informants that would attend various meetings or events that were held by the Aryan nations. The events and meetings were used by the organization to find potential recruits, and Randy was sometimes present at these meetings. Law enforcement already knew of Randy, as he had a dispute with a neighbour over some land. This neighbour had contacted the police and said that Randy was part of the Aryan Nations and that he was a dangerous person. The government informant attending these meetings clocked that Randy was a well-respected person in the Aryan Nations and began to work to become close to him and gain his trust. After several months, this informant realized that Randy was struggling to make ends meet with his isolationist lifestyle and saw an opportunity. The informant asked Randy if he would be willing to modify some shotguns for him and after some convincing, Randy agreed. Of course, doing this is against the law. A sawed-off shotgun is actually classed as a weapon of mass destruction, but only if shortened by a certain amount. On the 24th of October 1989, Randy sold two sawed-off shotguns to this undercover informant, 
The barrels of the guns were shortened less than a quarter of an inch less than the legal length. Eight months after the sale of the weapons, Randy was approached by two BATF agents. BATF stands for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. They told Randy that they knew about the illegal weapons transaction and that he either infiltrates the Aryan nation on their behalf and becomes an informant or he goes to jail and his family suffers as a consequence. Randy had a great deal of hatred for the government and now even more so. One of the main reasons the Weavers had moved away was to get away from government interference. Working for them was something that Randy would simply never do. Randy told law enforcement that he was not willing to comply with their demands and so Randy was arrested and charged. After these charges were pressed against Randy, Vicky wrote to the United States Attorney Maurice Ellsworth, addressing him as the servant of the Queen of Babylon, and wrote to him saying, The stink of your lawless government has reached heaven. Whether we live or whether we die, we will not bow to your evil commandments. Randy was released using his house as bond. Those who charged Randy gave him a date for court and told him that if he was to lose the case, he would also lose his house. The day of the trial soon came around and Randy failed to attend. Following Randy's failure to show up in court, the BATF started a surveillance operation. They knew Randy had weapons, hated the government and was a trained soldier, so they believed they needed to be careful in how they handled the situation. They set up hidden cameras, put audio recording equipment in and around the weaver's cabin and began to take aerial photographs of the family going about their business. A number of marshals were hidden around the property, planning on how and when to strike to arrest Randy. The media soon caught wind of the situation. An armed white supremacist family barricaded in a cabin on a mountaintop, refusing to cooperate with the police. The story certainly captured people's interests. The Weavers vowed not to leave their land. They relied on friends to bring them food and just stayed on their premises. On the 18th of April 1992, it was alleged that Randy had shot at a helicopter flying above his cabin. This accusation would later be used as a justification for what would soon happen. On the morning of the 21st of August 1992, law enforcement were conducting their usual surveillance of the Weaver cabin. This was the day the siege would begin. At the time of the siege, Sarah was 16, Samuel was 14, Rachel was 10 and Elisheba was 10 months. Kevin was also living with the family at this time. Randy, Kevin, Samuel and Stryker the family dog were walking around the property with their weapons looking to hunt some deer. Randy separated from Kevin and Sam. And while Kevin and Sam were alone with the dog, they heard a noise coming from the bush. The dog striker was alert and began to bark and look around for where the noise was coming from. The dog began to bark as he noticed some of the officers hiding in the bush dressed in camouflage. To stop the dog from barking, one of the officers raised their gun, took aim and fired. The bullet hit the dog, killing him instantly. Upon seeing his dog being killed, Sam shouted in anger, You killed my dog, and began to fire into the bush where the officers were hiding, and the officers fired back. Sam was shot in the arm. He turned and tried to run away, but as he did, one of the officers fired a bullet into his back, and Sam fell to the ground. Kevin began to fire his weapon at the officers, hitting one of them in the chest and causing them to retreat. Kevin ran over to Sam's side to check on him, but tragically, he discovered that Sam was dead. Realising there was nothing he could do, Kevin ran back towards the cabin to safety. After hearing 19 gunshots, Randy headed back to the cabin to see if everything was okay and Kevin wasn't too far behind. Back at the cabin, Kevin told them the devastating news that Sam had been killed. The officer that was shot by Kevin was named William Deegan, and William would later die from his injuries. The officers retreated and contacted their superiors. They told them that the situation had dramatically escalated and that reinforcements were needed as soon as possible. They explained that the Weavers had opened fire upon them and claimed the life of William Deegan. The officers would tell a different story than what the Weavers would. 
They claimed that they encountered Kevin and Sam, and that the two of them opened fire on the officers when they identified themselves as law enforcement. It wasn't long before the media heard about what happened at Ruby Ridge and the deaths of Sam and William created a media frenzy, but the standoff was far from over. The Weavers went down to retrieve Sam's body and brought him back up to the shed. Due to an officer being killed, the FBI became involved. The FBI were told that the Weavers had been given a chance to surrender and that they had not accepted. So they were instructed to fire upon any adult holding a weapon if the shot would not cause harm to a child. Permission to use deadly force was granted. They were told that they could and should use lethal force. Helicopters, tanks, armored vehicles and hundreds of servicemen and women were sent to surround the Weaver's cabin and snipers were stationed all around. The following morning, Randy, Sarah and Kevin got ready to go down and sit with Sam's body in the shed and pray with him. They grabbed their guns and made their way to the shed. As they began to walk down, the snipers opened fire. Randy was shot in his right shoulder. The three of them quickly ran back towards the cabin to safety. Vicky was back at the cabin and heard the gunshot. She ran to the door with her 10-month baby in her arms. She saw the three of them running towards the cabin and held the door open for them as they made their way back inside. Sarah helped her father Randy get back inside, followed by Kevin. And then, another gunshot. Sarah felt something splat all across her face and then saw her mother drop to the ground still holding on to her 10-month-old child. Vicky had been shot in the face. What Sarah felt splat across her face was indeed her own mother's blood. The bullet had passed through Vicky's face, killing her instantly, and had also hit Kevin in the chest. They were able to duck down and drag Vicky back into the cabin and put her body in the kitchen. Kevin was in an immense amount of pain and his wound needed urgent medical attention. As the days went by, journalists and reporters flocked to the area of Ruby Ridge, along with furious citizens who had heard that 14-year-old Sam had been killed by the police. They did not yet know that Vicky had also been killed. A blockade was created to stop the angry civilians getting too close. People from all across the country came to protest against the police and in support of the Weavers. But the Aryan nations also wanted to capitalize on the situation. They saw this as an opportunity to get more recruits and publicity, and they too came to protest. Law enforcement told the media that the situation was a dangerous one. They referred to the Weaver's cabin as a compound rather than a home. They also spoke about the alleged incident where Randy had shot at a helicopter months prior to the siege taking place. Over 400 federal agents were dispatched and stationed at the bottom of the cabin, along with countless armored vehicles and a number of helicopters. Following the second shootout, a negotiation team tried to speak with the Weavers. Every day, a negotiator would attempt to convince Vicky to make Randy stop and surrender. They would say, what did you eat for breakfast today, Vicky? Come on down here, we're eating pancakes. You and your family can have some. Messages like this would be blasted through a megaphone towards the cabin, in what was to the Weaver family an obvious attempt to rub salt into the wounds. The FBI would continue to do this, as Vicky lay dead in the kitchen for a number of days. The agents would later claim that they didn't know Vicky was dead inside the cabin at this point, although they did have surveillance equipment around the cabin, so really, it's likely they could have known, or at the very least, they should have known. This of course infuriated Randy and the children. They saw this as an attempt to anger him and draw him out so they could shoot him. The FBI attempted to give Randy a mobile phone so they could speak with him and come to some kind of peaceful resolution, but if there was any small amount of trust for the government before the standoff, it had all gone now. Randy refused to cooperate. Kevin was becoming seriously ill, his wound had become infected and he was going to die without treatment. Kevin pleaded with Randy to shoot him to end his pain. 
Randy refused and began getting Kevin some homemade remedy treatments which he claimed was able to keep the infection at bay. Six days went by with Vicky's body laying in the kitchen and Randy and Kevin were both badly injured with no sign of the siege ending anytime soon. That was until a man named Bo Wright heard of what was happening at Ruby Ridge and travelled there to be of assistance. Just like Randy, Bo was a former Green Beret and was sympathetic to the Christian identity movement. He was also somewhat involved in US politics. Bo wanted to help defuse the situation in a peaceful manner and he believed he could work as a third party. He told law enforcement that he would go and speak to Randy on their behalf and convince him to surrender peacefully. On the eighth day of the siege, Bo made his way towards the cabin to speak to Randy. Randy told Bo that the officers had shot and killed Vicky while she was holding their child and that he and Kevin had been shot and were injured. This information was soon shared with the media. Even more people came to support the Weaver family, shocked at what the government was doing. Sam's body was retrieved from the shed and Bo was able to get a body bag for Vicky's body and she was taken to a place of rest. Bo was also able to convince Randy to let Kevin be brought down the mountain to be treated for his wounds. Bo Greit was desperate to resolve things peacefully with Randy as soon as possible. The FBI had given him a deadline to make Randy surrender. They told him that if he failed to achieve this, they would launch a full-scale tactical assault on the cabin which could result in the children being harmed or even killed. After three days, Bo was able to get Randy to come off the mountain after assuring he would get a fair trial. On the 11th day of the siege, Randy surrendered to the federal government. He told his kids to pack their things and that they would all leave the cabin with Bo. When the family got down to the meadow at the bottom, Randy was allowed to give his children a kiss goodbye and they were sent away to live with their grandparents while Randy was taken to jail. Randy and Kevin were charged and their trial would soon begin in April of 1993. A defense attorney named Jerry Spence was willing to take on the case for Randy free of charge. The defense aimed at discrediting government evidence and witnesses and on the 8th of July the jury had reached their verdict. Randy was acquitted of all charges except the failure to appear in court. It was decided Randy had committed no crime during the siege. He was sentenced to 18 months to two years in prison for failure to appear in court and fined $10,000. Kevin Harris was acquitted of all charges, including the death of William Deegan. Randy had already served 14 months by the time the trial ended and was released in December of 1993. Randy and his daughters filed a lawsuit against the wrongful deaths of Vicky and Sam. They aimed for $200 million. An out-of-court settlement was reached in August of 1995. The federal government awarded Randy Weaver $100,000 and $1 million to each of his three daughters. During the court case, the federal government refused to admit any wrongdoing. Despite being found not guilty, many still believe that Randy and Kevin are responsible for the death of William Deegan and that if Randy had just cooperated, none of this would have happened. Following Randy's trial, a committee drafted a 542-page report documenting the wrongdoings of the government agents involved in the siege. The results of this report only resulted in some minor disciplinary actions. The sniper responsible for shooting Vicky was named Lon Horiyuchi. Lon was charged with involuntary manslaughter. Although for no reason, these charges were dropped and no further action was taken against him. The FBI and the US Marshals were also accused of destroying evidence. In the years following the siege, Randy moved to a location 100 miles away from Ruby Ridge. The Weavers still owned the property. Randy stays close to his daughters and he went on to write a book, The Federal Siege at Ruby Ridge, in our own words. The book was co-written with his daughter Sarah. A movie was also created based on the events. For Sarah, she greatly struggled with what happened to her mother and brother. She was diagnosed with PTSD and depression, but has since stated that she has found Jesus and forgives those who killed Sam and Vicky. She has since also disavowed her father's beliefs. A couple of things to mention before this video ends. 
The FBI used the case of Ruby Ridge for their training, highlighting the numerous mistakes that were made and how not to handle a situation of that kind. Also, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that Randy had allegedly shot at a helicopter passing over his cabin. The pilot of this helicopter was asked if this was true, and it wasn't. The pilot confirmed that Randy had never fired at his helicopter, and this was one of the main reasons law enforcement gave for using such force. And on Monday the 24th of August, around four days into the standoff, FBI Deputy Assistant Director Danny Colson, who did not know that Vicky Weaver had been killed at the time, wrote a memo which read, Something to consider. Number 1. Charge against Weaver is BS. Number 2. No one saw Weaver do any shooting. Number 3. Vicky has no charges against her. Number 4. Weaver's defense. He ran down to the hill to see what the dog was barking at. Some guys in camouflage shot his dog, started shooting at him and killed his son. Harris was the one who did the shooting. He is in a pretty strong legal position." End quote. And during the trial of Randy Weaver, it was revealed that he had actually been given the wrong court date. Federal Officer Cal Richens admitted that while court officials advised him that Randy should appear for trial on the 20th of February 1991, he mistakenly told Randy that the date was the 20th of March. That's why he failed to appear in court, which ultimately led to the siege at Ruby Ridge.